effects of equilibrium and hearing. So we have a number of different activities that you're going to do in lab, some related to hearing, some related to equilibrium, but it should be a fun lab. This is some interesting anatomy and physiology that's quite different from uh, anything else that we see in the body. So enjoy this week's lab, and I have a brief slideshow for you. It's about 20 minutes, so enjoy that, and we will see you in lab this week. Now we'll discuss the anatomy of the ear and also the relevant physiology to the senses of hearing and equilibrium. So let's first break down the ear into the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Uh, we can talk about it this way for a number of different reasons. First of all, in different areas here we have sound traveling through or the um, what we perceive as sound coming through the external ear as a sound wave then moving in through the middle ear as a vibration and then transferring into the inner ear as actually a fluid wave so it's really interesting that we're changing a sound wave uh, three times in these different areas so um, what we have to bring in sound is this structure called the pina and basically this is our external ear it looks sort of like a funnel it's an oddly shaped funnel but then in this smaller area we have what's called the ear canal and the ear canal is actually going to amplify the sound that's going to allow these sound waves to then hit this tympanic membrane and turn that sound wave into a vibration moving through these bony levers. And then we're going to get to an area called the oval window. And the oval window and the round window are really important structures because this area here called the cochlea is actually a bony structure. And what we're going to do is pass a fluid wave through the cochlea to stimulate a membrane that will then transfer that signal to the nerve. So what has to happen on either side here is that we have to have equal pressure in the oval window or the round window. Otherwise the wave would be basically blunted uh, and it couldn't move through there and transfer sound the proper way. So this sound or this vibration from the ossicles is going to vibrate the oval window and that will turn into a fluid wave now. The fluid wave is going to pass through the cochlea and again that will stimulate a membrane that we'll look at in a couple slides and then that fluid wave will get back to the round window and be dissipated and that's the basics of what we're going to look at with the different regions of the ear but again we separate this into the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So when we talk about hearing, we're talking about the perception of energy carried by sound waves. So sound moves in waves through the air, and there are two different things that we're concerned with with this. We're concerned with something called frequency, which is the amount of waves in a certain time period. And then we're also concerned with the amplitude of the wave, so the size of the wave. And frequency is actually perceived as pitch and amplitude is perceived as loudness. So this week we actually have tuning forks in the lab. We're going to do a number of different hearing tests with the tuning forks so that'll be a, a fun exercise this week but what you'll notice when you start to work with the different tuning forks is that you're hearing much different pitches and that's because they're basically set up to be tuned at a certain pitch and this is giving us different wavelengths so here is what we're going to look at the, the distance between the waves as far as how we perceive pitch amplitude is something different it's basically the size of the wave so how large is the wave and amplitude we actually perceive as loudness how loud something is and that's measured in decibels. So we have frequency measured in hertz, 
and then we have the intensity measured in decibels. So this is uh, just a diagram that's going to basically walk us through how sound gets into the ear, is transferred into a vibration, and goes through the fluid wave. So I'll talk through these steps. So first the sound wave straight the tympanic membrane, and this becomes a vibration in the ossicles. So that sound wave is then transferred through the three bones, and they're going to vibrate up against the oval window. So now this is going to create a fluid wave moving through the cochlea. This fluid wave is then going to pass into the cochlear duct. And when it goes through the cochlear duct, it's actually stimulating something that we call hair cells that are going to bend in a certain way that will cause ion channels to open. And that creates an electrical signal that is going to transfer it's going to move as an action potential down the cochlear nerve and get back into the brain. And we'll discuss where that goes in just a minute here. And finally, the energy waves are going to pass back out through the round window into the middle ear as, again, a, an, a pressure wave in the air instead of uh, in the fluid. So here we can look at the cochlea and this is a cross section of the cochlea. Here you can see the bony structure and the three different areas. So we have the vestibular duct, we have the tympanic duct, and these are both filled with a fluid called paralymph. And then in the center area we have the cochlear duct and the cochlear duct is filled with something called endolymph. So here we can see a membrane called the tectorial membrane. And this tectorial membrane is actually part of an, a thing called, well, a structure called the organ of corti. And this is what is really going to help us change the fluid wave into a transmission, an action potential moving down the nerve. So fluid wave passes into this cochlear duct. Tectorial membrane is moved by that fluid wave. That causes the hair cells to move in a certain direction, and that causes the release of neurotransmitter, passing themselves down the nerve as an action potential through the cochlear nerve. So now we're looking at the cochlea if it were actually straightened out, and we can't do this, but for the purpose of basically looking at uh, the cochlea and the structures inside of this, it's a useful way to examine it. So here we have the cochlea, and you can see the oval window where the sound wave would enter in, and this is going as a vibration from the ossicles into a fluid wave in the vestibular duct here. And what's going to happen is that this, is, this fluid wave is going to pass across something called the cochlear duct, and then into the tympanic duct and back out the round window as a sound wave again. So this is going to be then a wave traveling through the air in the middle ear. So just a summary of what's going on here. We have paralymph in the vestibular and tympanic ducts. It's similar to plasma. We have endolymph in the cochlear duct. And this is secreted by epithelial cells. It's similar to intracellular fluid. And then the co cochlear duct contains the organ of corti. And this is going to have the hair cell receptors and the support cells. It's going to sit on a basilar membrane. And it's going to be partially covered by a tectorial membrane, which bends the stereocilla. And this is in response to the fluid wave, basically. Uh, pushing on that tectorial membrane. So here is a close look at a cross section of the cochlea and here we can see the different ducts that I've just mentioned. So here's the vestibular duct, the cochlear duct, and the tympanic duct. And this, when, we, when I mentioned the organ of corti, this is this area right here. The hair cells are going to be embedded in that area. 
uh, the tips of the hair cells will stick out here and the tectorial membrane will actually be able to push on those hair cells, uh, stimulating them to release neurotransmitter and then that would trigger an action potential that would pass back down through the nerve and this is the cochlear branch of the vestibulo, vestibulo cochlear nerve. So here we can see a closer look. The fluid wave is going to push on this tectorial membrane. The hair cells are going to be stimulated. And here we can see the connection with the nerves. So at rest, we have about 10% of ion channels open. So we basically have a um, just a low-level stimulation of our hearing when we're just uh, when there's no sound present or anything else like that. Then in the case of having the tectorial membrane stimulated and pushing on the hair cells in a certain direction, we can see an increased neurotransmitter release and therefore an increased action potential or an increased amount of action potentials. And then finally, if we have the hair cells moved in the other direction, we are going to have inhibition. So in that case, we're going to have no action potentials passing through. And here what we're looking at is just the membrane potential of the hair cells and how that is changing with regard to whether we have excitation or inhibition of hair cells. Now, there is a membrane called the basilar membrane that is actually stimulated by frequency, but only certain pitches in certain areas. So the beginning of it is actually a stiffer region, and this stiffer region is going to be sensitive to high pitch, so high frequency. And then the far portion of this, so this would be all the way down in the cochlea where we've kind of spun around a couple times and we get to the other end. Here, this is... Um, a more flexible area and this is going to be sensitive to low pitch or low frequency. So here's a diagram just explaining that. It's showing a frequency diagram of uh, motion of the basilar membrane. So right here what we have is low pitch being stimulated way out at this end and high pitch being stimulated at the other end. So the auditory pathways are as follows. We have the cochlea transforming sound waves into electrical signals. We then have the primary auditory neurons of the brain in the medulla oblongata. And then the secondary sensory um, system is going to go up into the midbrain and then the thalamus before going out to the auditory con cortex on both sides of the brain, so the right and left brain. And this diagram here shows us that basically if we perceive a sound on our left side, that is actually going to cross across right here at the medulla oblongata and be sent up to both sides of the cerebellum as well as both sides of the cerebrum. So we actually do perceive sound that we hear in one ear on both sides of our brain, and that's for a processing of being able to put together and integrate what these sounds actually represent to us. So there's a couple different ways that we can actually uh, lose our sense of hearing. Uh, the first is called conductive and this is going to be no transmission through the external or middle ear. This is uh, due to either the external ear not allowing the sound waves to get in and then in the middle ear it can have something to do with either the tympanic membrane being uh, damaged in some way or the ossicles of the ear not working properly. Then we also have a central uh, hearing loss and central hearing loss is going to refer to the nervous system structure so something within the cochlear nerve within the vestibulo cochlear nerve or back into any portion of the brain in the auditory contact, cortex. And then finally we have the sensory neural uh, structures in the inner ear, so this is actually the cochlea that might have some damage to them where uh, they are not performing properly and that would also result in hearing loss. Finally, we have a vestibular app uh, apparatus. So the vestibular apparatus is actually a series of interconnected fluid filled chambers. We also have things called otolith organs and this is the saccule and the utricle. They are able to uh, the 
Autolith organs are able to help us to interpret linear acceleration and head position. And then we also have the semicircular canals, which are going to help us to perceive rotational acceleration. And these areas are fill, filled with the endolinth that we've seen in the past. So here we have a superior semicircular canal a posterior semicircular canal and a horizontal semicircular canal. And then we have the cristae with ampulla and th these are basically the areas where we would find the otoliths and I'll discuss those in a little bit here. Then we have something called the utricle and the saccule. And these areas are going to be areas where fluid will shift into as well when we have movement of the head in a certain direction. So here we can look at the specific semicircular canals and the first one, the posterior, posterior I'll mention basically helps us to identify when our head is moving in the direction of either bringing our left shoulder closer to our chin or actually the opposite is true, bringing our chin closer to our left shoulder or bringing our chin closer to our right shoulder. So it senses movement on an angle of the head. Then we have the superior canal, and this is stimulated when we basically nod our head yes, so forward and backwards, or when um, the fluid in this area is stimulated by that movement. And then finally we have the horizontal canal, which is stimulated when we turn our head from side to side as if to shake our head no. So what's going on here is actually just the fluid moving in these different areas that is going to influence these um, areas of autolith concentrations here. So to go on just a second here and explain what's going on, we have the endolinth, which is a fluid, and then we have this cupola, which is actually a gelatinous structure, and that is going to be in contact with these hair cells and when the endolinth is moving in a certain direction we are then going to have influence of the cupola and that's going to push on the hair cells and again that'll bring us back to the nerve and center in action potential so here's an actual diagram of the endolymph moving in one direction and the cupola being pushed and then for that reason, we know that the head must be rotating in the other direction. So it's kind of a counterintuitive thing, but if the uh, cupola is pushed in one direction, the head is moving in the other direction. Now I mentioned these autolith organs. Uh, the autolith are basically crystals, and they have a mass to them because they are crystals. So basically what we're um, perceiving is their force down on this gelatinous autolith membrane and down underneath we have the hair cells of course that are going to pick that up and perceive that so here what we can see is that when an autolith is just sitting in one place it's pushing down on the gelatinous autolith membrane that is letting the hair cells know an autolith is sitting here we must be sitting still then if we have the head move in a certain direction, the autolith is going to move down that gelatinous autolith membrane. It's going to influence the hair cells, and we know that the head is tilting posteriorly in this case. So the equilibrium pathways for this is that we have the fluid moving, we have these autoliths moving in a certain direction. Uh, this is going to stimulate those hair cells that's going to travel back the vestibular branch of the vestibular vestibulocochlear nerve this is going to go to the brain stem up to the cerebellum and it's also going to go up through the midbrain through the thalamus and to the cerebral cortex and we also have input from the somatic motor neurons um, controlling the eyes so we, I'm sorry, we actually have output to the somatic motor neurons controlling the eyes that are going to coordinate what might be going on as, with our head and how we actually uh, put this all together to give us our balance and sense of balance.